I'm Andrea Necchi, I'm a medical oncologist and associate professor of oncology at Vida Salute San Rafaele University in Milan. I'm a director of GU Medical Oncology at uh, uh, San Rafaele Hospital in Milan. I'm leading a group which is focused on the medical treatment of uh, genitourinary cancers. So the Keynote 564 study was a phase three randomized study of adjuvant pembrolizumab versus placebo in patients with glial cell renal cell carcinoma after nephrectomy. Uh, the study uh, compared the one year of adjuvant treatment with pembrolizumab versus one year of placebo. And, uh, and after 24 months of median uh, follow-up, uh, the study demonstrated a significant, statistically significant and clinically meaningful, meaningful improvement in disease-free survival endpoint, which was the primary endpoint of the study, with an hazard ratio of 0 0.68, uh, corresponding to a reduction of the risk of death or occurrence of about 32%. Uh, so the study actually met the primary endpoint. Uh, the overall survival uh, is still uh, immature at the time of the presentation. Um, despite this, uh, there is a promising signal of uh, an hazard ratio, an hazard ratio of 0 0.5, which is still immature, uh, with only 25% of the events uh, that already occurred uh, compared to the overall events uh, that are required prior to the final overall survival outcomes. But the trend is promising. And, uh, and survival uh, was uh, impending survival outcomes. The, the safety signals are also promising. Uh, with um, with uh, a rate of uh, treatment-related adverse event of grade three five of about eighteen uh, percent, uh, which is in line with the with the literature with single agent pembrolizumab in these patients, and only less than twenty percent of the patients actually discontinue treatment due to the occurrence of adverse events. Well, in my view, uh, it may be. Uh, because uh, the, the data, the interim analysis that has been, that's been presented is quite promising. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is a great debate around the issue of the disease-free survival in, um, in association with, uh, with survival, overall survival, and how a disease-free survival improvement can translate into an overall survival improvement. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, disease-free survival is one of the endpoints uh, that could be achieved and should be achieved in adjuvant trials, uh, coupled with safety outcomes. And DFS and safety outcomes are clearly in favor of pembrolizumab compared to placebo. So the, the only remaining question and the remaining point is uh, the magnitude of effect of pembrolizumab over placebo in OS. Uh, but I think that uh, based on the, on, the, on, the, on the data, on the efficacy data, the interim, on the interim term, uh, about the DFS and uh, the quite well uh, safety profile, which uh, the, the drug which was quite well tolerated overall by the patients uh, with the minimal rate of discontinuation. I think that there is uh, an high chance of having a new standard of care approved uh, in the post-operative setting for RCC. It's a very important question, uh, and at the same time, it's a tricky question because uh, in the Keynote 564, uh, there was a substantial amount of uh, translational analysis that have been uh, um, put in plan, but none of these analyses, uh, uh, biomarker analysis, have been already presented. So it's uh, it's really difficult to envision a possibility to further uh, identify a population of the patients who been benefited the most from adjuvant pembrolizumab versus placebo. In particular, we, we still uh, we start, are waiting for data on the pd one positive population, uh, and we will see whether a, a proportion of the patients, at least uh, within the ITT analysis, will benefit uh, the, the most from, uh, from, uh, from pembrolizumab, in particular in the, in the pending the, the final OS uh, analysis. Uh, and there are also a, a myriad of other opportunities for identification of biomarkers. So in, uh, in total, uh, we don't have uh, clinical factors that may orient us towards uh, 
uh, and, and a higher efficacy of the of, uh, of adjuvant treatment uh, with the with immunotherapy. So the treatment is really for uh, for all comers. It should be noted that the, the majority of the patients included in the keynote 564 were patients with an intermediate high. Uh, and uh, more frequently with an intermediate risk rather than a purely high risk uh, uh, disease. Uh, and also the, the, the proportion of the patients included with the radically resected uh, uh, metastatic disease, so an, an uh, M1 radically resected disease was minimal, so the numbers were very, very limited. So in these two populations, so in the population of patients with a very high risk disease, probably we will need uh, uh, more numbers and the longer follow-up. Uh, with all the, the, the adjuvant trials in the curative setting, of course, a special focus on um, toxicity and tolerability of treatment and mainly a long-term uh, should be made. Um, overall, uh, as I said, the, the, the toxicity profile and safety event, adverse event profile of pembrolizumab uh, aligned the available data on RCC uh, as well as on, on, uh, on other solid tumor types so with uh, a proportion of patients experiencing grade 3-5 uh, treatment-related adverse event uh, approximating 18%. Uh, most importantly, uh, the rate of uh, discontinuations uh, due to the, the occurrence of uh, severe adverse events or intolerable adverse events uh, uh, was, uh, was minimal, was less than 20%. Uh, of course, uh, a more uh, an in-depth analysis of uh, quality of life outcomes is pending, so we'll, this will likely be presented in the next few months. Uh, and this analysis, of course, may make corroborate the findings, the efficacy findings from adjuvant pembrolizumab, uh, but overall based on the data that are, that are available so far, uh, toxicity doesn't seem to be a really an issue uh, in, this, in this setting, in this setting like it was uh, with the different drugs like TKI, like it was for example with sunitinib or other TKIs in the same clinical setting and this is the reason why, for example, the s track study, which led to registration in the by FDA of adjuvant sunitinib, was, uh, was mili minimally applied to clinical practice uh, and not available in the, in the European Union. There is a, a substantial number of uh, similar studies, phase three potentially registration studies that is ongoing. Uh, among these studies, uh, very similar in the design to the Keynote 564, uh, we have the Emotion 010 with Atezolizumab compared with placebo. Uh, the Checkmate 914 with Nivolumab or Nivo and Dipilimumab versus placebo. Uh, and other studies, larger studies, academic studies like for like Prosper or uh, Rambert, uh, exploring nivolumab versus observation or duvalumab or duvatreme versus observation. Uh, all of these studies uh, basically have uh, the disease for survival as the primary endpoint. Uh, so the, the same question that, that rise with, uh, with, uh, with the Pembrolizumab study will rise, of course, uh, for, the, for the same studies. Uh, will uh, randomize uh, the new drug against placebo or observation. This is uh, an important difference that should be outlined. Uh, but basically, uh, another, another final question that these studies will, uh, will, uh, may answer in the near future is uh, whether single agent or combination therapy by using anti-CTLA-4 antibody will uh, be endowed with an, an even higher efficacy compared to the single agent immune checkpoint inhibitor in the adjuvant postoperative setting.